Absolutely. It's our distinct pleasure first to thank again uh, Eldon um, for and his wife for making this possible. Thank you so much for bringing it to our attention and and for for you know helping shepherd us through this uh, program. And also thank you so much to uh, to Dr. Richard Schwartz, to Lisa Affelberg, and to Sarah Eifler for being able to put together such an informative program. Uh, we look forward to the great debate. I'll let everyone decide later who's the Ramban and who's Pablo Cristiani, but uh, that's, you know, I guess uh, everyone will decide on their own a little later. And uh, with that, I will turn it over and uh, allow, um, I guess it's Sarah who's going to do the intro, right? So take it away, Sarah. And Sarah, one more thing before you get started. We had decided to, in order to moderate the Q&A, if people want to send the questions to me in the chat, um, so under Lisa Affelberg, and I'm just going to copy all of them and make sure that at the end of everything, we get to all the questions. So please go ahead and do that too. Thanks, Sarah. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, and thank you again to Rabbi Mordechai and Rabbi Eli and to all of you for having us. Um, I am going to just Briefly, as a, as a quick housekeeping note, if everyone could please keep yourself muted um, during the presentation, just for the sake of time, so there aren't interruptions. Uh, we have a lot to get through, so I think most of you have heard now that the schedule is for tonight. We're going to go through um, a brief, as brief as I can make it, a uh, presentation on the holidays, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, practical tips for actually enacting making plant-based choices, and then there will be the great debate. Um, and then following that will be uh, Q&A. So as Lisa just shared, please be sending her your questions as they come to you. Um, but please don't uh, ask them until the question and answer period to me or to whoever is presenting. Okay, so with all of that, I'm gonna share my screen so we can get going. Okay. And it's loading, okay. so. We talked last week, you may remember, about uh, plant-based Judaism as the Torah ideal. And this week, we want to talk a little bit about what that actually means in practice and one of the main ways in which we practice Judaism and what our Torah and text teach us is through the Chagim, through the holidays. Um, so first, a little recap of what we talked about last week. Um, so you may remember we talked about how we are created vegan and gone Eden in the Garden of Eden um, and how the very first human being is told by Hashem, look around you at all the plants, that's the food that you're going to eat. Um, and again, that there is no debate around um, what this means, that it's very clear that this is in explicit instruction for the human being to be vegan in the Garden of Eden. And that with that comes the responsibility to care for all of Hashem's creation, that uh, we are created with Selim Elohim in the image of Hashem. And the relationship of uh, care and, and rulership in the sense of responsibility that Hashem has with us is the relationship that we are meant to then echo with all of Hashem's creation, including the non-human animals. Um, so that relationship of, of respect and trust, we see in Bereshit 2 when um, Ha'adam names all of the animals, um, and that is kind of the establishment of what the ideal vision of how Hashem's creation was meant to operate, um, how that gets established. And then we come to the time of Noah and the flood, um, where the permission to kill and eat animals for food is given for the very first time. And you may remember how Rav Cook calls that our lowest spiritual state, um, and how with the this permission to eat animals, um, there comes the line, the fear and the dread of you shall be upon all of the animals. So coming from this place of um, you know, rulership and responsibility um, and living plant-based um, as Hashem's vision, where Hashem looks down and says, Tov Ma'od, very good. How we go from there to this point of having that rupture uh, in that relationship. And yet with it comes the very first restriction on what we can and cannot eat, which is kind of the precursor to the laws of Kashrut as they are later developed. And that is the blood is the life, how uh, we are not to eat blood because that is where the life is um, and how that law and the laws that follow it guide us to, in the direction of making thoughtful and intentional and plant-based choices um, as a way of, of 
enacting that sense of responsibility that we still retain. And then we come a little bit out of Torah, go into Nevi'im, to the prophets and Isaiah, um, and the vision in uh, chapter 11 of Isaiah of the world to come, of this peaceful, um, you know, beautiful, harmonious time in which explicitly oh, it is said <laughs> that we will be. No, yeah. I don't know how. And just as a reminder, if you could please keep yourself muted. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so we have established the Torah ideal is vegan, but what does that mean for us in terms of the actual experience of living out our Judaism and our values through the cycle of the year and the time? Um, so I'm going to talk about specifically Torah holidays and actually even a little bit more specifically the Shalosh Regalim um, as kind of the main framework for um, talking about the holidays and talking about that experience um, with the understanding that, of course, all of the Chagim, all of the holidays um, have this sensibility to them because it's part of all of Judaism and then all of these things are integrated. But with a, a focus specifically on the Shalosh Regalim because it's, because it's the clearest with the Shalosh Regalim that we are actually enacting um, the celebration of the agricultural cycle, the cycle of the year and of time and seasons when it comes to these three pilgrimage holidays. Um, and so we see the way in which we are living on the land um, and living out what happens in, in the natural world of Hashem's creation through the celebrations that we have at the specific times of the year. So um, from Hashem, three years, you shall hold, two times a year, you shall hold a festival for me, starting of course with Pesach. And in talking about Pesach, it called Chag HaMatzot, having um, the food the, that we eat as the kind of central symbol of the holiday. Um, and also bringing in, as we're talking about time and cycle and season, bringing in the history, bringing in the connection of lineage and ancestry um, and story, that this is uh, the time of our liberation, the time of our becoming a people and how that is enacted through the food that we eat um, and through this time of, uh, of the wheat as part of the agricultural cycle. And then of course to um, Shavuot, coming to the first fruits of what you sow in the field and then uh, Sukkot, the Feast of Ingathering, at the end of the year when you gather in the results of your work from the field. So very clearly establishing how what we are living on the earth in terms of being a people of the land and being a people in the promised land where all of these food products and all of these um, crops are what make, it, make us able to live out our lives in the land, how that is the central element of what we celebrate throughout the year and how that demarcates time. And so what that kind of brings us to is the understanding that underpins all of this, which is that the land is Hashem's. The land is not ours to own or exploit. The land is not something that we make use of for our own sake without thought. The land belongs to Hashem. And in that we come to this passage from Shemot, the choice first fruits of your soil you shall bring to the house of Hashem of Adonai. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So I'm gonna talk about part two of this verse in a second, but first to talk about what it means to be bringing the choice first fruits of your soil to Hashem that you don't even benefit from the very best produce, the first produce um, that comes on your land. And why is that? Because it's an acknowledgement of the gift that is the land that Hashem has given to us, knowing that the land belongs to Hashem and not to us. Um, and so in that framework, when we bring those, uh, those offerings to Hashem, it's acknowledgement and gratitude of Hashem giving us the means to sustain ourselves and to live. And what it comes down to is a celebration of life, that we are showing Hashem our gratitude and our understanding of how these foods that's, uh, that demarcate the cycle of time, how they give us life, how they sustain life, how we are held on the land, by the land, and with the land for life. And so that, 
kind of goes to explain how this is not a non sequitur. How you shall not boil a kid, and, and I'll point out again, as I did last time, how the English translation adds this layer of remove by um, using it, um, using a word we would use for an object, whereas the Hebrew, of course, does not do that. Um, so you shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk. Why? Because milk is the symbol of life. Milk is the uh, what a mother gives to her baby in order to sustain and, and grow his life. Um, and so to mix the, um, and of course this becomes separating meat and milk, but to mix the, this central element of life with the death of, of a, a baby animal is something that is explicitly forbidden because it does not give the respect and acknowledgement of what that life means. That kind of circles us right back to this whole concept of how living on the land and off the fruits of the land, which is Hashem's, which is a gift from Hashem, is about life. So I know that a lot of you are probably thinking this, how can we on the one hand talk about the Chagim and the celebrations of, um, you know, of the agricultural cycle, of the crops, of life. How can we say all of that? And yet, when we look at the Torah um, where it lists all of the holidays, you see over and over again, here are the sacrifices that you make. How do we kind of reconcile those two seemingly opposing uh, ideas? So I'm going to focus in on a few passages from Nevi'im, from prophets, um, but I want to be clear that this is the discomfort around animal sacrifice that we see here is not only in prophets, it is throughout all of Tanakh. Um, but here it kind of becomes the most explicit. So looking at Isaiah, um, Hashem saying, what need have I of all of your sacrifices? I am spaded with burnt offerings. I have no delight in them. Hosea, I desire goodness, not sacrifice, obedience to God rather than burnt offerings. And Amos, if you offer me burnt offerings, I will not accept them. We have Hashem saying here, I don't need your sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifices. And in fact, I will not accept your sacrifices. All of which kind of comes to the central point, which is um, explicitly talked about in the Talmud and Menachot, that sacrifice, animal sacrifice, is not for the sake of Hashem, it is for the sake of the human being. That the human being in ancient times offered animal sacrifice because it was something that uh, was helpful or, or they felt was beneficial to them, to our ancestors, and it was not something that was beneficial to Hashem. Nachmanides actually makes this exact same argument, that the idea of animal sacrifice is so that the human being coming to uh, the spilling of blood, blood is the life, um, having a feeling of gratitude and understanding around the gift that is life through an acting death, um, and that that is what makes sacrifice powerful. And it was powerful. But it's also something that was clearly uncomfortable for uh, people of the time, Hashem saying, I don't want this or need this. Um, and of course, with the destruction of the temple, we no longer do animal sacrifice. And so we kind of come back to what is it really about? What are the, the Chagim, the festivals, and the celebrations really about? And that is not about this this sacrifice, it's about our history and lineage, our responsibility to the earth and to each other, and about life. And so I want to end on this passage um, talking about Shavuot, since we're coming up on it. That on that same day, you shall hold a celebration, a sacred occasion for you. And this is a law for all time in all your settlements throughout the ages. So the cycle of time and the seasons, um, the cycle of work and rest, and of course, the history and lineage, bringing all of that together. And then immediately following, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap all the way to the edges, the law of Paya. So immediately in this cycle of time and sacred season and understanding of the agricultural cycle, 
immediately with it is responsibility and is understanding of how the, the land is not ours to own or exploit, but is for all in the name of Hashem um, and how all of these elements come together in an understanding that what we celebrate and what we want to be celebrating and to be uplifting through our holidays is life. And so the question then becomes, how? How do we actually enact this? And how do we actually come to a holiday and celebrate it in a way that lives out experientially these themes that we've been talking about? Um, and so I will pass to Lisa to answer that question. Um, next slide. <laughs> Um, so for my part, um, I wanted to share with everyone that this does not have to be all or nothing, and even small changes can help. So if you wanted to learn more based on what you learned last week and are learning this week and are going to learn from the great debate, there are mentoring programs nowadays that can help you learn to change your diet, along with a lot of plant-based alternatives at the grocery store. I also wanted to remind you that it's not nearly as hard as it once was when I became a vegetarian at age six and was given a bowl of lettuce and told that, I, that they hoped I was satiated. It is not nearly as hard to uh, reduce animal products as it once was. And as you can see from this slide, these are all Jewish foods that are still made without any animal products. And um, basically I wanted you to know and be assured that we can still enjoy all the Jewish foods and flavors we've always loved. We just need to learn to make them with new recipes. And I would argue that kosher cooks are already very creative at finding substitutes when they're cooking. And they know, for example, that we don't necessarily need an item to be made out of dairy to be rich and creamy. And so, I'm pointing at the picture of the bagel, and I'm not sure if anyone knows what those locks are made out of. Those are plant-based locks. Does anyone know, just a show of hands of yay or nay, what those would be made out of since they're not made out of fish? Freya, you want to say? Carrots. Sweet potato. Right. How about sweet potato? No. Those are made out of carrots. And oh. um, I do think you can do, we've done sweet potato bacon before, but those are carrot locks. And my point around this is that by the time you roast and put an item like that in the same brine as you would do when making salmon locks, they really taste the same way. And so, so much of food is the way that we prepare it and flavor it. I also wanna be sure to point out that eating less meat is much more easily accomplished than many other things we can do to help fight climate change and global warming. And I know our presentation didn't get into that area as much because we were focusing so much on Torah last week and on holidays this week, but there's a whole presentation around how the animal agriculture industry is contributing to these issues in terms of global warming and climate change. And we can reduce our meat eating immediately Purchasing solar panels or fuel efficient vehicles, which is also something that can be done, costs a lot of money and most people can't easily do these things. If you're wondering if what you cook really makes a difference, I would like to cheerlead on that and say, I believe it does. Every individual action you take models behavior for someone else. Every purchase you make or don't make sends a signal to the beef, grocery or restaurant industries. And individual action is really just the first step toward collective action. Um, next, oh wait, and then the, uh, the um, pate there, that is made out of mushrooms and walnuts. Um, all right, next slide, Sarah. Um, and then finally, I just wanna leave you with, if any of you are inspired individually or if your community is inspired, we can help you. We are here to help you learn how to make um, shifts. And um, Sarah's and my email are on here and please feel free to contact either of us. We'd love to support you. And as you can see from this slide, we offer a program called Plant Pathways, where we support people who are on that journey towards reducing their animal product intake and eating more plants. Um, so looking forward to hearing from you and looking forward to helping you more. And we are going to turn it over now to the great debate. And um, how this is going to be done is that Rabbi Mordechai is going to read the questions and he's going to alternate between the answers. Richard is going first and then Rabbi Eli is going first the next time around. And um, they each get three minutes to respond and I'm going to be keeping an eye on the time for this. 
So um, with that, Rabbi Mordechai, you ready to ask the first question? Okay, sorry, just kidding. So I'm just going to pin both <clears throat> Dr. Schwartz and Rabbi Eli together on the screen. So, and I uh, should also remind them both that they're getting a 30 second warning as well. That's right. So I'm gonna alternate between our, our two debaters. And, um, and first question goes to Richard. The question is the following, in three minutes, does modern meat production violate Jewish laws? And perhaps you can also make reference to production and consumption. Oh, Richard, you're on mute. Okay, I wanna thank everybody for setting it up. I wanna thank Rabbi Eli for agreeing to uh, have this debate. And we wanna commend Sarah and Lisa for their wonderful presentation. Okay, actually, definitely, that animal-based diets and agriculture violate at least six fundamental Jewish mandates. And these are to take care of our health, to treat animals with compassion, to protect the environment, to conserve natural resources, to help hungry people and seek and pursue peace. So a little bit of time that I have, I want to get into some of these, and first one, to take care of our health, as you know, Pikuach Nefesh, the uh, concept that we have to do everything possible to save a life, that right. overrides 610 of the 613 mandates. Very important. Torah says, Benishmatem, be open, I shall take him. Be very diligent in taking care of your health. And uh, many peer reviewed studies in respected science, uh, medical journals have shown the connection between animal based diets and heart disease, cancer, other life-threatening diseases. And basically consistent with the great sheet, chapter one, verse 29, that science is fine. We are much closer to herbivorous animals in terms of our hands. We don't have the sharp, dagger-like teeth of carnivorous animals. Our stomach acids are only 1 20th as strong as that of carnivorous animals. And that is why there are so many health problems. Most people have omnivorous diets that are much closer to uh, uh, herbivorous animals. Now, in terms of the animals, uh, the Judaism, we are supposed to be Rachmanim B'nai Rachmanim, compassionate children of compassionate ancestors, and we are to emulate God whose compassion is over all of his creatures. And that is indicated in Ashray three times a day in the daily prayers. But uh, the realities on factory farms are very far from the Jewish teachings. One quick example, where dairy cows are raised today, they are artificially impregnated every single year so they'll be able to continue to give milk. And whereas the normal life could be 20 or 25 years, it's only about five years. And then they're taken away for slaughter after that. 30 okay. seconds, Richard. Okay. So again, uh, animal-based diet very far from uh, Jewish teachings. And uh, as Lisa sort of indicated, there are so many plant-based substitutes today with the appearance, texture, and taste so similar to the animal products that even long-term meat eaters can't tell the difference. So given the fact that we have these plant-based substitutes and that the diets are so far from that, how can we justify continuing to eat meat? Time. <laughs> I gave you five extra seconds because you were on mute for those first five seconds anyway. Um, yes. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for having this class. I feel a little bit uh, that uh, Dr. Schwartz is, uh, is a world-renowned uh, expert in uh, veganism. I'm, I'm just a handsome rabbi, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm nervous he's going to beat me in the debate, but not to the extent that he'll eat me alive, because I know that uh, I'm a I'm busser, so I'm not worried about that. I will say this, after spending a couple of weeks looking forward to the debate, I've actually never been happier not to be a vegan or a vegetarian. I'm so happy that I eat meat. And I think that uh, I'm blessed to enjoy the beautiful things that God gave me. One of them is vegetarian, carrots. I love tomatoes. I love apples. I love green apples. And I love chicken and I love fish. So I'm actually um, you know, very comfortable after doing my research that I'm comfortable not being a vegetarian. I was nervous, uh, but I'm actually very comfortable. I just want to highlight 
that, uh, yeah, of course I agree that animals shouldn't be, uh, uh, if you read the omnivore's dilemma, they should not be, uh, uh, you know, treated uh, to slaughter. But uh, I did my research on, uh, on what goes on in Canada and CORE, which is the kosher certification in Canada, requires all chickens to be free range. So they're all, uh, kosher chickens are absent of any growth hormones and are uh, antibiotic free. Um, and they're all grain fed. fed. Uh, Ramosha Feinstein has his laws about not eating veal and uh, we respect those laws. So I think that on the full part, Hashem gave us a beautiful world. Hashem gave us a world to enjoy things. One of those things he gave us to enjoy is meat. All of the items that you mentioned um, about the Gan Eden, the Gan Eden era and the, uh, the Messianic era, you forgot to include one era, the era that we live in. God, since Noah, allowed us to eat meat. I don't consider myself holier than the Torah. And since God allows me to eat meat, maybe he'll say, don't eat a lot of red meat, but he'll also say probably don't eat a lot of potato chips either, which I struggle with. And so I'm very comfortable living a life that Hashem allows me to eat meat. Hashem didn't say it's not allowed. I've gone through the entire Talmud, 2,711 pages, uh, one and a half times, and not a big discussion on veganism. There's a lot of discussion on Lashon Hara. There's a lot of discussion on Tefillin. There's a lot of discussion on Rosh Hashanah. On Pesach and Shuas on Sukkot, you do not find a mandate to be a vegetarian. So yes, I personally need to cut down on my seconds. potato chips. I need to cut down on my pretzel intake, my donut intake, and I probably need to cut down on my red meat. I like hot dogs. I like pizza. I like a lot of things, and I need to be healthier. I also just want to highlight that all of the verses that were quoted uh, saying that Hashem doesn't want offerings, Hashem doesn't want bogus Judaism. And so if you're bringing an offering and you're just trying to bribe the Lord, it's, it's a fraud. So Hashem wants your heart. And so, yes, when, when the Navis look at the people bringing offerings and saying that's bogus, that's because they're just doing, uh, they're trying to bribe the one above. And Hashem doesn't want that. Hashem wants your heart. Mordechai, you're on mute. Okay, I get five extra seconds. I was on mute. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we go on to question number two. Th this next question will be directed first to Rabbi Eli. The question is, do Jews have a, an obligation to consider whether um, kosher certified products are with Jewish values? In other words, is kosher certification enough? Okay, I think that's a very important so. question. And I would say 100% that, there, that uh, Jews do not have an obligation to have kosher certified products aligned with Jewish values. We have to appreciate that Judaism has a body of law, and then there's something called lefnei mesher sedin, above the letter of the law. So um, it's a perversion of the Torah to start saying that things which are above the letter of the law are the law. Hashem said, these are the laws, yes, should I dabble with sunrise every day? Of course, that's an ideal, but I don't. Hashem says, do, Hashem just try to do a lot of things better. But when you start saying that the thing that is the ideal is, 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 is obligated, then you start perverting the Torah. I just want to highlight that, the, that King Saul showed Rachmanas. In this famous opportunity to destroy Amalek, he showed mercy on Amalek. And Hashem said, I am, if the, and, and, and uh, Shmuel said, for the person that is more merciful than God, we have to worry about that person. And what is Shaul do at the end? He destroys the city of Kohanim. So it's a double whammy. We have to appreciate that the law is the law. And when you try to be more religious than God, it's a scary proposition. God allows meat and uh, God allows potato chips. Everything in moderation, but God allows it. So for one to say, God allows it, but I'm going to be better than the one above, it's a dangerous proposition. You're changing Judaism. Judaism allows it. So you, you don't like to eat it, great, but I don't like to eat my mother-in-law's cooking. I'm not going to eat it. But to say that a super value, a lefne mesher is a din value, you have to keep, that's a, that's, that's a mandate. That's 100%. If you don't do it, you're not, you're, not, you're not living Judaism. And I find it ironic that I had the vegan meal, it came in a plastic lid, in a plastic uh, a bag. Um, a, a guy went in a car and drove it to me. Um, there's so many problems in the world. Let me just speak of plastic, obesity, 
smoking. Uh, we should allow. We should not allow alcohol anymore because of all the people that die in uh, in, in in car accidents. With we should only allow grape juice. There's materialism. There's tons of pornography going on, screwing up the minds of our young uh, uh, boys and girls. So much is going on in the world. There's wars going on. So much is going on in the world, and we're we're focusing on saying this is the value that you can't eat meat, even though we're allowed to eat meat. So I think that it's very uh, healthy. I think it's very healthy to take a step back and say, what does Hashem want from us? You know, you mentioned Rav Cook in your lecture. Rav Cook is a big fan of veganism, uh, but Rav Cook is just one opinion. And if you're going to follow Rav Cook all the way, maybe I hear you. But Rav Cook is just one opinion as to the ideal state for now. The Torah and the Talmud clearly say that meat is allowed and enjoy it and enjoy the Alps and enjoy a steak every now and then. Time. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to point out very strongly, we are not saying that Jews are obligated to be vegetarians or vegans. We are saying there's a choice. People have a choice in their diet. Shouldn't that choice be based on the highest of Jewish values? And shouldn't we take into account and how horribly animals are raised in factory farms? The fact that there's an epidemic of diseases related to uh, the eating of meat, contrary to Jewish teachings on that. Shouldn't we take into account the very negative effects on the environment and the fact that while uh, millions of people are chronically malnourished, dying, there are hunger and effects every year, 70% of the grain produced in the U.S. is fed to animals destined for slaughter. And shouldn't we take into account the tremendously wasteful things that uh, the animal-based diets, uh, very wasteful land, energy, water, et cetera. Now, in terms of uh, the question of kashrut, the way that animals are treated today is so contrary to the spirit of Jewish values. Now, Rabbi uh, Riskin pointed out once that the dietary laws are designed to teach us compassion and lead us gently to vegetarianism. One other important fact is there are so many scandals today in the uh, inspection of meat and all. Rabbi Stav, uh, who was a leader in the Soha group here in Israel, indicated everybody knows that the Kashrut system is broken and that it is corrupt. So the thing is, we have a choice, should be based on the highest of Jewish values. Would God want us to have a diet that's so harmful to our health that treats animals? And then, you know, it just says every day, God's compassion is over all of his creatures and the way they are treated are just so far from basic Jewish values. And uh, you mentioned Rav Cook, he believes that in the ideal time to come in the messianic period will be vegetarian or vegan period. He bases that on a powerful prophecy of Isaiah that in that ideal time, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the lion will eat the ox, no one shall hurt or destroy in all of God's holy mountain. So uh, to be in the spirit of Kashru, which is designed to teach us compassion, to think that uh, people should be uh, vegetarians and even preferably- 30 seconds. Okay, so basically finish with that uh, answer, thanks. So sorry. It's okay. Okay, the uh, question number three goes to Dr. Schwartz. What responsibility do Jews have regarding climate change? Okay, this is the most important reason, really, that people should be vegans, that well, climate change is the greatest threat to humanity. It's really an existential threat. And this is not just my opinion. This is the opinion. It's such a strong scientific consensus on this. 97% of climate scientists, every major uh, climate change group, the science group, We've that, and thousands of peer-reviewed articles in respected science journals. Temperatures have been going up every year, 22 years in this uh, century, all are in the top 23 top years. And um, <laughs> the, the uh, glaciers are melting, the polar ice caps are melting, permafrost is melting. So these are all signs of that. And also there's been an increase in the frequency 
and the severity of climate events. And the future is very, very uh, frightening in a way because what is happening is what they call self-reinforcing positive feedback loops could reach a tipping point and uh, that you know, climate tipping point, which could be a disaster for the future. Now, the important thing is uh, the only possibility of a uh, bearing a climate catastrophe is though it's very difficult to happen, but that would be a society-wide shift to plant-based diets. And that is because two very important factors, uh, the cows give off methane, and that is a greenhouse gas that is about 84 times as potent as carbon dioxide. And that's only in the atmosphere 10 or 20 years. So if there's a shift away from uh, animal-based diets, far less cows, and uh, far less methane, and again, being uh, disappearing in 10, 20 years, that can be a major factor, whereas carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. But even more important than that is that uh, to shift to plant-based or vegan diets, that would free up the best areas now used for grazing animals and for growing feed crops for animals, that could be reforested. It used to be six trillion trees in the world. Now there's only about three trillion. If that was reforested, that could uh, sequester. Thirty seconds. That could sequester much of the atmospheric carbon dioxide and bring it down to a safe level. Atmospheric carbon dioxide is well above the 350 parts per million that climate experts say is like a threshold value. It's now way above that at 420. So again. We have to sequester that very dangerous carbon dioxide level, get it down to a safe level. Time. Okay, so I'm finding it very difficult to follow why anyone is, is a, a, a purist vegan and vegetarianism. If the main reason is carbon footprint, then I have a great solution. Everyone can have their hot dogs and everyone can have their hamburgers and we'll just use bicycles. The main issue with, uh, uh, with, 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 with the world is, first of all, dictators, and second of all, cars. Let me just read you a study here uh, from the government of Canada. In 2020, the oil and gas sector was the largest source of GHD emissions, according, uh, accounting for 27%. In 2020, the transport sector was the second largest source of GHD emissions. Uh, in 2020, the agricultural sector was the fifth largest source of GHG emissions, according to, and then 10% of total emissions with 69 uh, megathons of carbon dioxide equivalent. There's no issue here. We can all have hamburgers and steaks and just drive bicycles. So you say, well, we should do this, we should do that. To me, it all comes back to what does Hashem want from us? Hashem, you talk about the Messianic era, you talk about the Garden of Eden, by the way, I'm not going naked, even though the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve were naked. I'm wearing clothing. We are allowed to eat meat and enjoy meat. And yes, there's so many tangential issues going on. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you're, you're putting together seven or seven or eight arguments. I don't hear any coherent argument not to eat meat. Hashem, Hashem allows us to eat meat. I just want to say also that we talk about caring about, about the animals. I mean... Who should get more care, a cow or a big dog, a big dog or a small dog, a small dog or a rabbit, a rabbit or a spider? I mean, every time you're going through the grains, your John Deere is killing millions and millions of Nebuch spiders that are going to be dying and, and leave their, all their children's spiders orphans. And how many are have their legs split off and are still sitting in the John Deere tractor? There's so much violence to the spider community when you have grains. I know you sound, hey, that's silly, but why is a spider worth more than an ant, which is worth more than a rabbit, which is more, do we start having a counting system? And on top of that, let's say they come out in four or five years that plants have feelings. Let's say they come out, and by the way, this is a study, I don't know the word for it, uh, some of the, the, the antennas, whatever the word is, plants have feelings. So we're gonna stop having plants. We're gonna stop ripping the plant out of its life source. I mean, if Hashem really wanted us to go full blast on this, send some, 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 send it to me. 30 send, seconds. Send it. 
right? Then Hashem would have done it. But Hashem allows us to, to harvest grain, even though he knows we're killing not hundreds of thousands of cows, but billions and billions of unprovoked spiders and ants. They did nothing wrong. And now we're killing them. So why are why is a cow's feeling worth more than an ant's feeling? I don't know. I know that human beings are human beings and animals and spiders are animals and spiders. Hi. Okay. Very good. We go to our last question. And for our last question, we start with you, Rabbi Ellie. Okay. You... Should you ask the question? Okay. Just trying to build up some suspense here. Should the Jewish community embrace the ve- ve- Vegism as an authentic expression of Jewish values. Okay, I guess you probably get the sense from me that I would think that this is, would be a disastrous decision. Let me just highlight something from Perkei Avos. Rav Tzadik Omer, don't separate yourself from the community. And let me do the last line. Don't make a Torah a spade in which to dig. I find that vegetarians come with, okay, Vegetarian is the way to go. Halacha, I don't necessarily put on tefillin. I don't keep Shabbos. I don't, I, the Lashon Har, I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little not so good on. I'm not so good on all the minor fast. Hanukkah, Purim, Sneas, covering the hair, covering the knees. I'm not so good on those things, but vegetarian is the most important thing. So I'm going to look into the Torah and make a spade of the Torah. I'm going to find all of the sources that somehow paint a picture that vegetarianism or veganism is, is the way to go. And I think that's using the Torah as a pawn in your vegetarian uh, decision-making. Now, you have to start with what does the Torah say? Take a step back and say, what does the Torah? I just want to highlight also, Rav Cook. everyone likes to follow Rav Cook. Rav Cook is a das yach, which means he's a one position man. If someone wants to follow Rav Cook to the wall and everything, then I would say the following, follow Rav Cook. great. Rav Cook was a vegetarian. He believed that was the right thing to do. But let me tell you, if you follow Rav Cook on this, you have to follow Rav Cook on everything. I'm sure you want your wives to vote in elections. And Rav Cook held that women shouldn't vote. So you say, well, I don't have to buy into that, Rav Cook. The point is, Rav Cook said things, and you don't have to agree on everything Rav Cook said. I don't believe in that. But there is a consensus. There's a consensus of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And so we have to work very hard to make sure that um, that certain values, we have to we have to look at the world and say the world has become very woke. Some of, some of that's good, some of that's bad. But when the world says there are so many things that are, this is the Jewish value. The Jewish value is to allow, you know, things that the Torah is not comfortable with. And by the way, I'm not perfect. I have questions on Hashem. I can't understand why two men can't marry each other. I'll be honest, I'm an Orthodox rabbi. I don't get it. And when I die, I'll ask God, what, why, if they're, if they're same-sex attraction, why can't two men get married to each other? But I'm humble enough to know that that's what the Torah says. I respect two men marrying each other. That's their decision. But I'm not smarter than God. And when God says you're allowed to do that, this is the mountain I'm going to die on. I'm going to die on this is my mitzvah. No, I take a step back and I say, I'm going to learn Torah. I'm going to go through Gemara. I'm going to follow Halacha. I'm going to keep kosher. I'm going to go to Minyan. I'm going to stop blushing. I'm going to do all those things. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try to cut down on potato chips and live a healthier life. Okay, so I want to respond to a couple of things the rabbi said. Um, First of all, in the statistics he was quoting, that is not taking into account the opportunity cost of replanting the forest and take, reducing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that can make a tremendous difference. All the other things, riding a bicycle, uh, et cetera, it's not gonna make it, unless we do that, we're gonna have a climate catastrophe. And also, since the rabbi expressed so much concern about spiders and uh, the, the, the attractors and killing them, 70% of the grain produced in this country fed to animals destined for slaughter and uh, we could reduce to tremendous, we could leave, you know, we have a Shemitah year, we could leave the runway fallow, let them improve if we shift it toward a vegan diet. Now, I think veganism should be an important part of Judaism today. What good is having powerful laws about compassion for animals, about taking care of our health, if right next door in effect that uh, animals are treated so horribly? Uh, so that can make a big, big, big difference. And also it should be a part because again, the, 
the, uh, we're heading toward a climate catastrophe and uh, the fact that in this world with about eight, 8 billion people is somewhat about 80 billion farmed animals and all the negative effects. There are tremendous water shortages in the world. It takes about 13 times as much water on an animal-based diet than a plant-based diet. And uh, again, uh, so much hunger in the world, so much grain being fed to animals and uh, all the, uh, the negative effects of the animal-based diet. So I think to help revitalize Judaism, to show that uh, ancient Jewish teachings are still relevant. We should be shifting toward a vegan diet because that is the diet, again, most consistent with basic Jewish teachings on taking care of our health, treating animals with compassion, protecting the environment, you know, conserving natural resources, helping hungry people, seeking and pursuing peace. And in terms of pursuing peace, the rabbis saw that the Hebrew words lechem for bread and milchama come from the same root. From that they deduced when the shortage of grain and other resources, people are more likely to go to war. That we had seen in history many, many, many times. So again, bottom line are number one, that uh, animal-based diets violate- 30 seconds. Mandate and uh, we have a kind of possibility. Again, everybody can get the taste that uh, people seem to enjoy in terms of meat because there were so many plant-based alternatives with the texture, taste, and appearance so close to the animal products that people cannot uh, tell the difference. So for healthier you and a healthier and environmentally sustainable planet, go vegan. Time. I feel like everyone needs to take a deep breath. Yeah, I wanted to thank our 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 two uh, our two uh, debaters. That was uh, quite two a, debaters a, from Staten Island. <laughs> quite quite a vigorous debate, and uh, thank you everyone. Um, and uh, I guess I'll turn it over now to Sarah and to Lisa to take the next step with our program. Perfect. Yes, I want to thank our debaters as well. Um, and I was not noting all of the questions in the chat, and so I'm just going to curate those between, um, I think, those they're asking of us of Jewish Veg, but if there's anything for you, we'll turn it over to you. So, Sarah, I'm going to turn to you on how do you explain the custom of eating dairy on Shavuot? Oh, man. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there are about 20, 30, I think at my last count, reasons that I could throw out there for, for why uh, this custom developed, because the, the real answer is we don't really know. Um, one of the most common ones that's quoted is um, how we read um, that the uh, Torah is like milk and honey, and so we kind of bring in this the sweetness of, and abundance around fertility um, in terms of milk and honey. I'm going to the Torah. No. Around that is that when Torah is talking about honey, uh, the word vash, it's actually referring to a syrup made from dates, so it's to Ceylon, um, and that date honey is what is talked about. And when it comes to milk, what is the Torah talking about when it talks about the land as a land of milk and honey? It's talking about abundance and fertility and life, going back to the concept of milk as a symbol of life giving. Um, so in terms of uh, how that came about that that association was made. As far as I'm aware, no one knows exactly how. Um, but if you want to keep up with that tradition, which is a, a real and legitimate and valuable tradition, it's still possible to eat cheesecake and ice cream and all those fun treats on Shavuot. I certainly do. Um, but I also try to work in grains um, because, of course, Shavuot is really about harvest and about the, the crops that are um, in season at the time. Of course, where we live in US and Canada, we don't have the same agricultural cycle as the land of Israel, but still bringing in that acknowledgement um, and using plant-based products to make the cheesecake and the ice cream and to still have that fun celebration while being really serious about the understanding of what the holiday is about. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to move along because I actually have a lot of questions. So um, the next question is, why not fish? Their nervous systems 
seem to be less complex. And I think I'm going to take that one, um, if that's okay with my co-presenters. Um, there are actually studies that show that fish are sentient beings and do experience emotions. But if that's not something that you want to buy, um, I will also point out that we are severely ruining the oceans. And this is a really big and serious problem. And so when people talk about straws and water bottles and how we should avoid those because they know that there's plastic in the ocean. Actually, 50% of the plastic in the ocean comes from the remainders of the fishing nets that are left behind. And even if you don't think that fish are, are, are animals that deserve care or compassion, there are a lot of animals that, um, that, that you might think that do, like tortoises and seals and dolphins. And when they are sweeping up the fish the way they do, there's no way to protect against those animals also coming into the nets. And so they die a very painful death as well. Um, so there's a lot of issues. There's almost just no way to do this animal agriculture on the massive scale we do without these really ill and negative effects. In addition to the fact that we also have a social justice presentation that we didn't have time to present here, but the fishing industry has some of the worst abuses in terms of child labor and children who are peeling shrimp and like tied to their station where they can't go to the bathroom for like 16 hours a day and this is a really big issue so the, the a lot of people think i'll let go of red meat i'll let go of chicken and then oh i'm still going to do fish and fish is, is not really the solution um oh can you provide the names of prepared vegan products that are healthy most seem full of salt or additives like the beyond meat ones um I'm gonna research that because I do know some, I just don't remember their names while I ask the next question and I will answer those in a, mi in, in a minute. So um, there is a mitzvah in the Torah to eat f fish and meat on Shabbat and the holidays. And how do I fulfill this commandment as a vegan? Richard, do you wanna take that one? Okay, actually in the Talmud Pesachim 109a, it indicates that now that the temple is no longer here, it's no longer necessary to eat meat. So, and the fact that there are chief rabbis, including the uh, late chief uh, rabbi of all of Israel, Shlomo Goren, uh, who are vegetarian, vegan. So actually there's no need today to eat meat. So uh, again, important things, we have a choice. Everybody has a choice. That should be based on the highest of Jewish values. And that points to veganism as the ideal diet again. Um, thank you. Um, I'm still looking for the names of those brands that I can't recall right now, but I will find those. Um, Sarah, you, do you want to also answer that one? I know you have a, an answer because we've talked about this one about um, making your Shabbat beautiful without meat. Right. So, I mean, and I think this, I saw in chat something around how, you know, for a simcha, for, for bringing in the joy, that's why you kind of eat meat on, on Shabbat or on holidays. Um, and of course, the if I want to I want to be really clear, and especially in in answer to something that Rabbi Ellie brought in, which is that we are, and I think Richard said this, but we are not saying Jews have to be vegan by any means. What we're talking about is consciousness and aware around food choices. Um, we're talking about how we live in a, a modern age where the the kind of industrialization and mass production of animal products didn't exist at the time that these laws first came into place. Um, and so now we're in a, a time period um, between, between eras where we have choice um, and we have the ability to think through those choices that we make. Um, and so in that framework, thinking about what really brings the pleasure and the joy into your Shabbat experience or your uh, holiday experience, if you are someone who does not find joy in eating animal products like myself, then you're not meant to eat them because you're well, then you would not be experiencing the joy of Shabbos. So it's around what brings you that feeling of satisfaction and joy and peace um, on Shabbos or other Simchot um, to be able to really experience um, how that, that feeling of rest and joy um, and peace is meant to be. So um, going back, I guess, to, to choice and sustainment of life. Thank you. Um, I recall a sh Shabbat Zibirot, which talks about enjoying all kinds of foods on Shabbat, including, including meat as a delicacy. 
sorry, I was just pasting these, so I might be asking the same question. I didn't get to read them because I was just taking them down. As well, there's an old saying that a simcha is not a simcha unless there's meat. Rambam said the world of nature will, uh, will not change in times of Moshiach. Okay, I think I by accident combined two different um, postings, but I think the Shabbat one we answered. So um, uh, Sarah or Richard, you want to take Rambam said the world of nature will not change in the times of Moshiach. Okay, well, there's a uh, midrash that says that actually people will be at a higher madrigal at that time of Mashiach, that uh, because of that, there won't be a need for sin offerings or guilt offerings. Thanksgiving offerings are always appropriate, but that can be done with grains and all. And you wonder what kind of uh, a messianic period will be if there's not more harmony, more peace, if people aren't different in the world. So I think uh, that's the possibility. But again, let's hope uh, should only come soon in all. But the reality is today that there are so many problems, as uh, Rabbi Ellie indicated, so many problems in the world in terms of hunger and all. But actually, animal based diets make uh, all these problems far, far worse. Uh, he mentioned uh, yeah, war is a big, big, big problem. But again, by the way, they indicate that climate change makes more more likely because there's going to be tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, desperate refugees uh, fleeing away from the uh, the storms, the droughts, the wildfires, heat waves, and all. By the way, we're due for a shirat here for the third time already. The temperatures in India. Pakistan has been 115, 120, so that uh, there's a need for a change right now to a shift toward vegan diets. If we want to have a decent world for future generations, because the projections, again, the uh, uh, Secretary General of the UN has said, we are in a cold red for humanity. And you know, to, to raise 80 billion animals at a time when there are water shortages, when there's so much hunger, when we have these threats of war, when shifting to a vegan diet can really reduce all these threats. I think that is essential. And- Thank, uh, thank you. you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. I, I, so I found the burgers and someone was asking about, um, I think some of the healthiest plant-based burgers are called Hillary's. And then there's the Dr. P Dr. Prager's burgers as well. And I can and put I can those in the, chat, in the chat in the minute so you can look at them. But last week, if you weren't here last week, I did share that even though some of those uh, Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers are pr processed foods and are not therefore like a health food by any means. They still have no cholesterol in them and they use 97% less land and 92% less water to produce. So as Richard is sharing all of these really dire issues that we're facing that animal production causes, that plant-based production does not cause. Um, oh, I'll look and see if they're hectored. Thanks for asking. Um, these are really good solutions. I always tell people if you have a monthly burger night and by the time you dress it in your bun with all the, the uh, you know, things you're going to put in it and they taste the same, this is a far better and far kinder and much more efficient um, item to eat than a burger made from, from beef. Um, okay, let me keep going on with the questions. Um, uh, but so someone, I think people were responding to each other since we weren't able to respond. So someone says, but was it Hashem's intention to eat meat or was this a concession to our spiritual weakness? I don't know that we need to talk about that further because we, we kind of talked about that in the presentation. Um, and then someone says that eating meat in its most basic form is very violent. We are participants of a cycle of death and we need to move to alternatives that are more peaceful. Um, and then someone said that to say that to not eat meat in the Judaism is the ideal is incorrect. Um, Sarah, do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, so again, and and I believe Rabbi Eli um, kind of very eloquently made this point as well. It would be incorrect to say that Jews are required to be vegan. That is absolutely not true. Um, however, we're again in a place of choice, um, and whether that is making a choice to be you know, 100% plant-based, fully vegan, um, whether that's a choice to incorporate more plant-based choices into your diet um, as it stands, whether whatever level of choice that is, 
having the awareness and having the consciousness around food is a Jewish value um, and is very much upheld and uplifted through all of our text and tradition. And so being conscious, making choices based on the information that you have around time as it is now, the world that we live in now, and with the understanding of these ideals as being from Hashem and being uh, the what kind of carries us through our, our experience of time and ancestry and lineage and Hashem's will, being in a place of making choice from that perspective um, is in itself a gift. So again, by no means are we saying that there's a requirement to be vegan. That is false. But what you are saying is if you are interested in thinking more deeply around your food choices, here are options that are available to you um, and that we highly recommend in answer to some of the major problems we're facing in the world today in the context of Jewish text and faith and tradition. Thank you. Um, there was a question about um, the percentage of CO2 attributed to animals grazing versus the um, transportation industry. And I am gonna paste a link in the chat, Eldon, for you. Um, and um, there are so many different ways to point fingers and you can find articles these days that almost say anything you want them to say. But um, the research has been on the low end between 15 and on the high end between 85% of the greenhouse gases coming from the ag industry. And I think it's just how you talk about the refrigeration and the moving of all the, the meat that needs to be refrigerated to get it all over the place. But um, this article indicates that um, the animal ag industry is much more highly responsible. And as I said at the end of my little piece in the presentation, I don't know how people stop driving because that's not available for most people. I don't know that they can stop flying to see their relatives because um, that would be really difficult. But I do know that everyone can wake up tomorrow and choose different things that they put on their plate. So um, hope that kind of gives you something to read about that issue. Um, Someone mentioned that the Brazilian Amazon is being destroyed to allow beef cattle to provide the world with cheap beef, and this destruction is a major contributor to global warming, absolutely. Um, and then there's a, someone said a study shows that some plants communicate with each other, and there were studies that claimed plants scream in pain when pet. Um, Sarah, do you want to respond to that one? Um, I'll start, and you can you can take it from uh, there, Lisa, but um, be wary of of studies that say things like um, plants screaming or, or communication. Not that these things don't happen in, in their way, but the anthropomorphizing language around um, plants is what you'll find in, in coverage that is directed towards a lay audience um, and not what you will find in actual scientific peer-reviewed journals, because that kind of, of way of, of understanding um, the idea of, of communication, of, of talking, that's a very kind of human-centric, that's what our form of communication and understanding and experience of the world is. Um, and when it comes to how other um, organisms experience life, we don't have the ability to understand that framework. What that means in, in practical terms around diet um, is that we know and understand and can measure and see um, the pain and suffering of non-human animals. That is real and it's obvious and it's overt and it's egregious. Um, the hypotheticals around what if uh, plants feel this or that, what if this is happening, those remain hypotheticals. And in the case that, um, you know, tomorrow we find out plants feel pain, then the information has changed and then the choices change. But that's not what is true and real and in our face and, and a, a true disaster right now, which is that animals are suffering at such a unbelievable rates um, and to such an, uh, an incredible degree that there needs to be a response. And Lisa, you can take it from there. I know I love what you said. And I think the only thing I'd say is that so many more 
plants are killed to feed the, I mean, Richard made this point too, to feed the animals that are then going to feed people. And so the amount, if it's 100% of grains, that only creates 15% of food for people that is being fed to the animals. So again, this is an incredibly inefficient way to feed a world that is going to be 8 billion people. Because if we grew all those grains and vegetables and could feed them directly to people, we wouldn't have the problems of people starving the way that we're having, nor would we have uh, the Amazon rainforest being cut down to, for cattle to graze. Um, I think that that is it because I, I'm looking at the other questions and think we've answered them all. Um, does anyone have any question that you didn't type or any final thing we can respond to? I know we're going a little bit late, but we knew the time would be a little bit long tonight because we were getting in this great debate. So thank you for sticking around a little bit extra and I'll just see if does anyone have any other question that wasn't responded to. Could I make a closing comment? Sure. I want to thank uh, uh, everyone. I uh, felt like uh, 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 Dr. Schwartz, so good connecting with you, and uh, to Sarah and to Lisa, thank you so much. You know, I, uh, I played a little bit of devil's advocate here. I, uh, I do think that the Torah approach is to allow for me, and, and you concurred with that. I am nervous when the Jewish people start focusing on a secondary values and not primary values. I wonder if everyone would show up if we had a class on Lashon Hara, or we had a class on Sniut, but uh, it is a secondary value, but it's not a zero value. And I think that uh, this should be explored and I'm happy it was brought to the, uh, to the fore. And I just wanna thank everyone for coming and uh, for listening to this ogre hot dog eating, you know, mm -hmm insensitive Canadian. Um, I appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. And I just, just wanted to thank everyone. Again, I wanted to thank Eldon and Janet. I wanted to thank Lisa and Sarah. I want to thank Rob. I want to thank everyone who participated. And I just a, a shout out. Um, Ruth Blumenfeld is, uh, as I know, uh, watching the video here. And Ruth, that um, Ruth is sponsoring our Shavuos program. Shavuos might not be on people's radar, but realize it's less than one and a half weeks away. Wake up call. Shavuos is right around the corner. So we have our Shavuos information and registration online. www.fhjc.ca slash Shavuos 2022. You'll find it on our homepage. <laughs> Go take a look. Please sign up. Please come join us. I think Rabbi Ellie is going to be doing a, um, a, a, a session at night on eating gluten-free. Was that right, Rabbi Ellie? Eating gluten-free? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Losing 10 pounds for my son's wedding. That's what the class is on. So thank you all. Hope to see all of you and even more of you uh, for Shavuos. And Ruth, thank you so, so much also for making our Shavuos possible. And thank you, everyone near and far, for making this uh, program possible. Thank you so much, everyone. Dr. Schwartz, all the best. Thank you. Everyone, be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.